have the pleasure of int uh, introducing Louis Mel Madrona, who's here from the University of Maine at Orono. Um, and he, in his bio, oh, thank you. <laughs> we have a hot mic. Um, so Lewis is a bridge person having both indigenous North American and European heritage heritages. Yep, I'm doing a good job. Um, he is born certified in family medicine, geriatric medicine, and, and a psychiatrist, and also a PhD neuropsychologist. Um, and today he will pre be presenting integrative approaches to working with people diagnosed with psychosis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mel Madrona. Hi, everyone. Let's see, is that loud enough? Can you hear me? I hope the invisibles can hear me in Zoom land. So uh, these are my some of my affiliations. Let's see if it works. Didn't work yesterday, and it's not working today. Uh-oh, run get a techie, please. We need a techie. OK, OK. If you can click until the techie arrives, that would be really good. Yeah. I came early so that this wouldn't happen, and they said, oh, we figured it out. It won't happen again, ever. Well, guess what? <laughs> okay, that's somebody else's. That's not me. <laughs> We're having technical difficulties. Try now. Oh, okay. All right. So here's how to reach me if, if you would like to. And um, this is my wife, Barbara, who was going to come but got subpoenaed to court instead. So, yeah. Well, she has lots of lots of clients who are trying to reunify with their children. And she fights hard for them, and occasionally she wins. Actually, she hasn't lost in a couple years, so that's kind of cool. She wrote a really interesting paper, too. I'll, I'll just plug her for a minute, on the Indian Child Welfare Act. So if anybody wants to read about ICWA, it's in a journal called Eduaptamunk, with colon, the Journal of Two-Eyed Seeing. So anyway, which is published by the University of Maine and the University of New Brunswick. So, um, and there's my favorite castle too. Nobody lives in it. It's too expensive to upkeep it. But uh, it's in Najac, France. So, um, so in the in the work that I do in with Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, which is, we serve the five nations of Maine the Penobscot, the Pescatamakati, there's two of them, and uh, the Maliseet and the Mi'kmaq. And we also serve anybody else who's native, who happens to wander through our doors. And occasionally people that aren't native, because they just wandered in and nobody thought to ask them, <laughs> and that's all right. So, um, so anyway, we're trying to bring um, models of indigenous healing into the practice of, of psychiatry and mental health. And um, when possible, we like to work intensively with people. It's not always possible. And we also um, are very into stories because indigenous culture is all about stories. And we, we do a lot of other things too, and I'm not gonna read the list because it's a really long list, and there's not, not all of them are up there that we can do. And the point is, there's a lot of fun things you can do with people. And what I find is the hardest thing is to get people to want to do them. Like, I know so many fun things, and, and nobody wants to do them. Well, sometimes they do. Um, I have this acupuncture group on Wednesday mornings, and that's catching on. People like that. and. Um, we do some osteopathy, and that's catching on, people like that from time to time, though not everyone. And um, there's so much more I want to do than people will do. So, um, you know, I, and that brings us to lifestyle medicine, which everybody here knows how important that is. And probably everybody here knows how, how hard it is to get people to change their lifestyle, you know? Um, I spend a lot of time trying to convince people to walk. Get a dog, a dog will make you walk. <laughs> you know? 
Plus, it'll regulate your mood, because that's what dogs have been doing for 150,000 years. Um, you know, go to sleep. Don't drink Red Bull after five. <laughs> you don't need wings at night. So um, stop drinking Pepsi, right? You know, of course, if you say it that way, they never stop. You have, you have to, <laughs> I've, I learned it. If you say stop, then they do it more. So don't ever say stop. <laughs> it's always, and I wonder if there's some alternative to Pepsi, you know, occasionally. <laughs> Uh, so we call it the 4P diet, Pepsi, pizza, pasta, and pain, bread in French. <laughs> Maine, the, the, the second language in Maine is French. So the third one is Somalian. Um, so getting people, I, I work on all those things, but we're not going to talk about those things today because there's so much literature about those things that we don't need to belabor it. Yesterday I talked about, so so why do people go unwell? And I just thought I'd throw in a summary slide because I spent enough time on that yesterday. Um, this is the creek, by the way, where, by where I was born. and But this is a picture, a photo from 18-something, 1860, and I just thought it was kind of cool to have a, a photo of my creek from the 19th century. This is where my grandfather and I used to go fishing. She's doing Cherokee stick fishing, and we actually used fishing poles with worms. But um, anyway, so um, there's this idea in the indigenous world that every illness has a spirit, that everything has a spirit that everything has ontological validity. And um, one of the people that has really written beautifully about this is Eduardo Duran, who wrote a book called Healing the Soul Wound. And I, I really recommend that book. Um, so, so for every symptom, every ache, every pain, there's a spirit driving it. There's a spirit behind it with, with whom we can dialogue, with whom we can talk. And so we do a lot of of endeavoring to speak to these spirits behind pains, you know, the spirits that are fueling psychosis, the spirits that are fueling melancholia or um, anxiety and all those things. And, um, you know, there's a lot of agreement between indigenous North America and Buddhism. And there's a, a Australian Buddhist who who says that um, there exists consciousness in illness, that every illness has consciousness. And, and he uses the word intelligence to refer to that consciousness. And this is a, a quote from him that I really like. He says, every particle or subparticle of any material contains within it a form of intelligence which enables it to survive in a workable relationship each to the other. And that's very much compatible with indigenous North American thought. And, and so we want to dialogue with these intelligences. And um, so I, I've spent a lot of, of years with elders, and I've taken a lot of notes, and I've interviewed them uh, for podcasts, and I've um, hung out with them, and I've been a roadie for ceremonies and carried their equipment and, you know, um, all kinds of stuff. And so uh, some, of the, some of their perspectives is um, there's no bad people, only bad stories. And let me tell you where I heard that. So I was in a ceremony. Um, it's called an Anipi Kaga in Lakota. It, it, it's best translated as revitalization ceremony. And uh, it used to be called sweat lodge, but we were told not to use that term because uh, it, it came from the Jesuits. And that's not what it is. So the word ini means to breathe. It's a verb. And ini pi means they breathe. And kaga means ceremony. So it's a they breathe ceremony. And 
and in English it's better translated as revitalization because the idea of they breathe is that you breathe in the vapors coming off the hot rocks and it revitalizes you. It purifies you and wakes you up. So, um, so I was hanging out with this elder, John Charles, who's a, an amazing guy. In fact, he's worth a story. So I'm going to nested, I'm going to do nested stories now. And I'm going to tell you about John Charles. So John is a Cree, was a Cree. I don't know what he is now that he's a spirit. I wonder if spirits get to be anything they want. Um, but John was a Cree guy and, and he had, he was an Episcopal priest, Anglican priest, they say in Canada. So, um, and he got, um, brain cancer. He was 60 years old and the, the physicians told him there was nothing they could do. It was inoperable. They probably had about a month to live, you know, go home and do whatever. And so, um, he was in a quandary and his friend said, look, you know, there's this, there's this old Cree woman and she's got a track record with cancer. Go see her. And he said, but I'm a Christian. And they said, well, you want to live or not? <laughs> and he said, all right. <laughs> you know, so he went to see her and he started working with her. And a few months later, he went back to the doctors and they said, how come you're not dead? <laughs> And he said, well, I'm not going to tell you, but check on this cancer thing. And they looked, and he didn't have it anymore. So now John was in a quandary because he, he was struggling with Christianity versus the Cree tradition. And, and he, he went and set out on the hill, as is a traditional thing to do. And he had a vision of, of Christ in the center and elders smoking their chanupas on in each direction around Christ on the cross. And he said, hey, it's all the same. I can do both. <laughs> and so he started doing both. And he had, he had sort of an interesting combination of both. You know, it was kind of unique. There was a crucifix on the tree behind his, the structure he used for his anipis, you know, and um, little purple cloth, you know, draped around it. And and but mostly it was a pretty pretty uh, typical Cree ceremony, and uh, we didn't tell him that we we were looking for Jesus, but we couldn't find him, except on the tree. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I I like to hang out with him. He was he was one of my heroes, and I would take people to see him. He would hold clinic on Sunday mornings. He lived on um, um, Sturgeon Lake First Nation, which. If you've, has anybody ever been to Saskatchewan? No, I lived there for four years. I liked it. Um, it's a long story why I'm not there. and I'm not going to tell that story today, but if you come hang out with me after 5.30, <laughs> I'll tell it. So um, anyway, Sturgeon Lake First Nation is, is west of Prince Albert. And Prince Albert is where the provincial prison is. And it's all north of Saskatoon, which is the biggest city in Saskatchewan, home of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, I might add, my favorite football team. And um, anyway, I, I, would, I would go with um, John to the prison to, do, to help him do an EP ceremonies with the inmates. And so we were, we were there in ceremony one day, and um, this, this guy said, you know, hey, John, he says, I'm, uh, they're about ready to let me out of here. And they, they say, I'm going to come right back. They say, I got all these things. You know, I got the ODD and the ADD and the CDD and, you know, the PTSD. <laughs> and he says, and they say that there's no hope for me. That, that you know, um, and John said, you don't got none of those Ds. He said, you just grew up with bad stories. He said, you, you come hang out with us, and we're going to give you good stories. And one of, one of his other helpers was a character. Um, and he said, hey, fellow, he said, I was in here for 25 years for murder, and I got out, and I didn't go back. <laughs> he said, and now I go to high schools and talk to people about how to stay out of prison. He said, you can come with me and help me. <laughs> so, you know, they were enrolling him. They were recruiting him. 
into a whole different culture of stories and 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 telling him that his the bad stories that he grew up with could be replaced with good stories for him to live by and to stay out of prison and the idea is that more people tell and hear good stories the more likely they are to have an impact and um, there was another elder that I hung out with a lot named Vern Harper. And um, Vern Harper was the elder in residence for um, CAMH in Toronto, which is the Center for Addictions and Mental Health, um, <clears throat> the largest psychiatric hospital in Canada. And um, Vern said, if you want to change the world, start telling good stories and don't stop talking ever and so um Vern was was actually um an amazing guy he would go down to the to the worst part of toronto well where where indians lived and um or lived on the streets mostly and he would just sit there for a half day and he was he was the embodiment of Jacques Lacan, who said, the greatest gift you can give someone is to listen without judgment or interpretation, because that's what he did. And he said, I don't have to tell them to stop drinking. They know. When they're ready, you know, to stop, they'll come, they'll come find me. You know, I don't have to, I don't have to tell them anything. They know it all already. I'm just here, you know, to, to bear witness to the fact that they're alive, you know, to the fact of their life. And, um, and that was really amazing. Dan Smoke was the guy who, who always said, you know, miracles will always happen, but when you least expect them. So, uh, so don't expect them, but don't be surprised when they happen. And I'll, I got a little story about Dan Smoke, but by the way, this is a drawing of the Lakota Sundance. And, um, which is a, a really amazing healing ceremony that we do every every summer. And uh, so my story about Dan Smoke is he lives in Western Ontario. And um, so when my wife met him, um, you know, he sat down and he said, well, tell me your story. And so she started talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. And she took a deep breath and she kept talking. And she, and finally, she said, she ran out of things to say, and that had never happened to her in her whole life. She'd never actually got to the end of her story. And, and, and she stopped talking and he said, well, isn't there any more? And she said, it was this amazing experience of an, someone actually listening to the end without interrupting. And that was Dan. Um, and the point of this is that all of this happens in community. So we have to create community if we want people to be well. And there's a, a belief in Indian country that those who are unwell are, are doing so on behalf of the rest of us. And so it's our obligation to help them to get well because they're serving us. And so we need to step up and serve them that they're the, the sort of canaries in the mind. They're the proof that the world we live in is sick. There's, a, there's sickness in the world. So, um, and it's that idea that every story has a spirit. And the, the idea that in Lakota, there's this notion of the Naki. And people explain it in different ways, but my favorite explanation, um, comes from um, one, of the, one of the elders who's crossed over, um, Sonny Richards. And Sonny said that, so imagine that there's a swarm of bees around you, around your body, but they're actually stories. All of these stories, you know, circling around your body. And some of them are far away, like some bees go a long distance from the hive. And some of them are really close to you. And, and he said, every one of those bees has a little spark of the being who told the story within it. And, and he said, and, and 
that's a, a bit of their spirit that's in that story. And so you're forever connected to that being who told that story because you hold a spark of them within you. And, and when, when necessary, you know, we assemble, this is also Lakota uh, philosophy, we assemble a self from all these stories and all these beings who told these stories. It's sort of, it's sort of like there's a, a philosopher of, of mind who talks about the, the assemblage, he's obviously French, of the self from, the, from all these component parts. And, and that's very similar to the Lakota. Of course, the, there's, there's always, don't gossip because those aren't good stories. <laughs> So, um, you know, so once upon a time, um, Star Woman fell to earth. And, and it wasn't possible to go back to the stars. And in those days, there wasn't any land. It was all water. And they figured out that she needed some place to put her head and her feet. And the turtle volunteered. She, the turtle said she could live on his back. But they needed to go get something from under the, under the water. And so, so in this version of the story, Badger volunteered. And I'm giving you the short version now, because there's a much longer version. But so, and Badger dove down under the water to get a rock from the bottom of the ocean and some mud and, and brought it back almost dead. You know, just barely made it up on top of Turtle's back. And they spread that mud all over. And, and it began to grow and it became Turtle Island, which is where we are now. So, um, so sometimes you have to work as hard as Badger to get better. And, and, you know, the, the really hard thing um, is that we can't do the work for people. You know, too bad. <laughs> so, so sometimes we have to work as hard as Badger. And um, I'll tell you about another guy. Hawk Littlejohn was another elder that I hung out with for a while. He was a well-known flute maker in North Carolina. And um, one time I went with him into the hospital, uh, Chapel Hill, UNC, and there, were, there was a very wealthy woman who had requested to see him, and she was ill, and she wanted him to, to work with her. And, and so she, you know, they talked a little bit, and he asked her, um, you know, what was she willing, what was she willing to, to sacrifice in order to get well. And she started talking about how much money was she would pay him. And he said, I don't want your money. I want you to, I want you to do something truly selfless, and then I'll work with you. That's the, that's, that's the fee that I, that I want. That's my requirement. And um, she, couldn't, she could never pull it off. She could never figure it out. And he, so he never worked with her. And, uh, so, you know, Milton Erickson was, a, was a, a guy who did the same thing. You know, he would often give people things to do before they came to see him. Um, I, saw, I saw someone recently, and I, I told her that she had, to, she had to take six photographs of happy places before she came back the next time to see me. And she did. I was so thrilled that somebody actually did what I told them. <laughs> It's so rare. <laughs> and, and, and she said, you know, when I look at these pictures, I feel happy. And I said, yeah, you know, that was the point. <laughs> so um, so we, sometimes we have to work to find out um, how to get people to do their own work. So I'm going to tell you about a guy named Henry. And um, Henry had a bad habit of he would he would try and convince um, 
various provincial officials about the error of their ways. And he would, he would do this in a loud manner, perceived as threatening by them, which would result in his being taken either to hospital or jail. And either way, it wasn't pleasant for him. And there were, you know, there, there were signs when he would start revving up. And, and so, um, you know, I mean, it was noble. Henry wanted to change the world. And, and at the height of mania, he knew exactly what needed to happen. Though I wasn't sure that he was right, but he was. <laughs> and um, so we said, hey, Henry, um, why don't you come hang out with us and we'll see if we can figure out how to keep you out of jail and hospital. And he's like, well, that could be, that could be good. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, we threw him, we threw him in the lodge. We took him up to John Charles and threw him inside the lodge. And, and, um, after a few of those and some doctoring by John Charles, um, which is kind of indigenous energy medicine, um, he thought, you know, um, this isn't actually working, he said to us. And we said, really? <laughs> he said, yeah, because nothing changes and I just end up in jail. And we're like, no kidding. <laughs> and, and he said, you know, um, I need a new way to measure success in life. And, and we said, so Henry, you're really heroic, you know, but, but you're like one of those, you know, you're like that dude Sisyphus, you know, the guy that keeps pushing the rock up the hill every day and it keeps rolling down. And we, we need to find you something to do that, you know, doesn't undo itself every day. And um, so, um, so we started looking around for, for some noble cause for him to engage in. And, and he said, oh, I know what I can do. Um, I can work with youth. I can like keep, you know, help youth who've been, you know, incarcerated and they, you know, I, I could like, um, be present in a good way for them. And we're like, right on, you know? And of course we knew people who were doing that, that we could plug him into. And, um, so, you know, there was a lot of creating a safe space for him, you know, to reevaluate his life and giving him practices that he was familiar with, but wasn't using like smudging and, uh, praying, you know, and, looking, recreating his story as a heroic journey that he could be proud of. And um, finding something for him to do. So anyway, so I, I see this as what, what's, what's integrative about indigenous practice? Um, well, we like anything that works. So whatever works is good. If it doesn't, where's an elder? He said, well, if it works, I'm impressed. But when it doesn't work, I'm not too impressed. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, I, think, I think one of the key things about indigenous practice is its collaborative, non-hierarchical nature. So we don't, we don't think we're smarter than anyone like, like, I think you're the expert on you and, and, you know, um, maybe through dialogue, you know, through listening and we can, we can come up with some better strategies for you to do you, you know, like Henry's strategy of shouting at provincial ministers didn't work too well, you know? Um, so maybe we could find a better strategy for saving the world because it's noble to save the world. Um, so we want, we want to create a space for dialogical relationship, for conversations with all kinds of beings, with voices, with mountains, trees, you name it. And, and we're equal partners in this process where, you know, that's incredibly important. And I, you know, I spend every other month, I spend a weekend covering the psychiatric hospital, mostly so I can fly to conferences like this. 
Thank you, hospital. <laughs> and, um, and it's so hierarchical. You know, it's just sad how, how layered it is, how hegemonic. And, and um, you know, it's, it's the opposite of what we want to do. So, um, so I think what we're trying to create is, is what Helmut Rosa calls resonance. I don't know, is, are you guys familiar with Helmut Rosa? Anybody read him? A couple have. So Helmut Rosa is a German philosopher of sociology. And he, he's written three books, um, Acceleration, Alienation, and Resonance. And Acceleration is about contemporary, our contemporary world. He says, so, you know, it's going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And the result is alienation. And, and it's the most um, cogent critique of, of capitalism that I've ever read in Resonance. And he talks about how um, all of the things that capitalism promotes as the good life aren't. And the, the good life is, is invisible within capitalism. And, and so the good life has to do with feeling resonance with those around you, with your environment, with, with the place where you live, with the work that you do. It's creating group coherence. You know, it, it's, every, it's all of us vibrating at the same frequency when we're, in the, when we're together. And you know that happens, that when people are together, their heart rates synchronize their brain patterns synchronize, their breathing rates synchronize. And um, for women who live together, their menstrual cycles synchronize. So we get into the same rhythm with each other. And I think when that happens, healing occurs, that it's magical and mystical. By the way, bears do it too. <laughs> so, <clears throat> So I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, talking circles or healing circles because I I think Indigenous North Americans have been doing open dialogue longer than the Finns, and the idea of a talking circle is you get everyone together who has a part in an issue, and you start with a song and a prayer and smudging, and the convener of the circle poses. The question, and there's a talking stick, which is um, usually a very beautifully decorated, and it goes around the circle. If you're in Lakota country, it goes clockwise. If you're in Haudenosaunee country, it goes counterclockwise. And um, people speak as long as they wish. No one interrupts them. And it just keeps going around until everyone is done. Though I, I have to put a little asterisk and say that nowadays, sometimes we have to stop when the lights go out. <laughs> that we can't always do a three-day talking circle like in the old days, they could do that. Because indigenous democracy was not majority rules, it's, consen it's everyone has to come to a consensus. And so in, in when talking circle was used as a governing device, it would just continue until everyone was in agreement. There, were no, there was no voting. Everyone had to agree. And so, um, so the idea, it's a really powerful experience. I don't know, have anybody, have any of you done a talking circle? Some of you, yeah. And what's powerful about it is you realize that other people are as smart as you. <laughs> that people say what you were going to say before you got to say it. It's, it's novel <laughs> to some people to realize that. And also that when it's finally your turn that you, you often surprise yourself with what you say, like it isn't what you expected you would say. And, and there's something really um, powerful about speaking to the center of the circle and not to any one individual. To just to just be putting your words into the center and allowing them to be present. <clears throat> and it, I think it's an incredible way to, to solve problems. And um, 
this kind of shows you the, the, the contrapoint, which is that the average physician listens for 18 seconds before interrupting the patient. And if, if you can get them to lengthen it to 24 seconds, they can reduce doorknob complaints by 37%. Do you guys know what doorknob complaints are? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so listening to people is a powerful gift. I've been showing these pictures of an EP structures, so I figured you, you got the point. Um, and our friends in Australia, in the Gulpa Ngawa uh, dialect, call it dadiri. You may have heard that term, meaning the deep listening. And um, it's that powerful experience I was talking about that my wife had with Dan Smoker that I had with Vern Harper of just being heard and not being judged and not being interpreted. So, um, you know, evil is still in, in the world. And one of my best examples is the Wounded Knee Massacre, which um, happened in 1893. I think it was 390 some unarmed women, children and men were killed by the US cavalry firing these new uh, fancy machine guns into the crowd. And this is a photograph of the dead being, pi being piled into a mass grave. So um, it's probably important that we know the history of what the US government has done. And um, it's, it's usually hidden from us, um, but the animals know and they can tell us you probably did you know when when we're not looking that they that they actually act like people so they have to put on animal costumes when we're looking because they don't want us to know that they're really people in animal skins and um ceremony you know that's a really important part of this so this is the this is the structure this is one of my former structures for an EP ceremony. We used to put um, buffalo robes on them, but they're too expensive. So, <laughs> so now you can get sweat lodge tarps from Canadian Tire. <laughs> and they're cut really well for this structure. You can't find them in the United States, so you have to get them from Canadian Tire. So, um, you know, we have any, has any of you been to an NEP ceremony here? Well, if you ever want to, um, you can come visit me. We're conveniently located on the road to Fredericton. So, <laughs> Fredericton has an incredibly famous Salvador Dali painting, too. I don't know if anybody knows that. It's worth going there just to see the painting. <laughs> All right. So, anyway, we, we, we heat stones and we bring them into this structure and we pour water on the stones and it's a revitalization. It purifies you and, and, and it also is a portal. It creates a way to communicate with the spirits because um, I'm, I'm not sure why, but they like it hot and dark. And when it's hot and dark, they're more willing to communicate. So um, I've probably, I've done thousands of these. And um, when we get a newcomer, First timer, we usually put salt and pepper on the altar, and we tell them <laughs> that if they die, we'll eat them. <laughs> so, <laughs> no one's ever died. <laughs> so anyway, it's a portal to, to talk to the spirit world. And I, I just wanted to mention too, Hamblechias, which is the crying for a vision. And um, this is, the, the traditional place where people would go, and it was originally called Bear, as in B-A-R-E, Butte, because it's naked on top, but the, the settler colonists thought they were talking, they said B-E-A-R, Butte, and the locals said, well, that sounds better than naked butt, <laughs> so let's, we're gonna call it Bear Butte. <laughs> so they did, and, <laughs> and, the, the Cheyenne get it in June, I think, and the Lakota get it in July or something like that. 
But um, people do these vision quests all over the place, and they're really kind of lovely and supervised by elders. And people, people do them for one day, two days, three days, four days, you know, whatever you feel up to. This is the Sundance, and um, I've seen amazing healing happen at the Sundance. And I've seen um, people, people who are psychotic become non-psychotic. Occasionally, people who aren't psychotic become psychotic, sadly, um, because they they just get overwhelmed by the power of it, and they don't they're not grounded. So we like people to be part of a teoshpie, which is a, a community that goes to the Sundance and takes care of its members. This is from this is a painting of the Sundance from some from the nineteenth century. And this is this is one of the places where I dance. In uh, it's on the Cheyenne River Reservation. It's called Pejute Ishnala Naji. It means medicine that stands alone. And uh, this is the road into the into the Sundance grounds. And this is a a sign uh, on the way in in Eagle Butte, which is the closest town in South Dakota. And we thought it was kind of cool. It's, it, it was done by a kid we know um, who does murals all over South Dakota. And um, to his chagrin, his last name is Smith. And he's like, why couldn't, I have, why couldn't my parents have had a good Indian name? Like, why is my last name Smith? And we're like, dude, you can change it. And he said, well, no, you know, because I'm now a famous artist. <laughs> you know? <laughs> anyway, Mitakwe Asin. What that, what that means is, in Mi'kmaq, it's Natukalimk. It means the interdependence and interconnectedness of everything. So, um, so at the end of a Lakota prayer or song, you say Homitakiasi, which means, you know, to the interconnectedness of all of us, that we're all connected. And I want to say a few words about Albert Marshall. Um, he's one of my heroes. He's an elder from. Um, Eskasoni First Nation in um, Cape Breton, New Brun Nova Scotia. And Albert and his wife, Merdina, brought the idea of two-eyed seeing into the mainstream, Canadian mainstream. I don't think it's in American mainstream yet, but it's, it's really prevalent in Canadian academic culture. And the, the idea of two-eyed seeing is that you need more than one way, you need more than one perspective on a problem. And the indigenous perspective is as valid as the acad contemporary scientific academic perspective. And there might even be more good perspectives. So explanatory pluralism is the notion. And, and so the word in Mi'kmaq is Eduaptamunk, which is the name of our journal. Um, but we spell it out for you in the, after the colon. The Journal of Two I'd See. <laughs> so, um, so everything we do has to proceed from this understanding of Natukalimk. So, and that, um, which is why we're responsible for people who are su suffering, because we are all connected, and and anyone's pain is also my pain. We all feel everyone's pain, and. Um, I talked a little bit about this before, but um, this is this notion of the North American indigenous self is very similar uh, to um, Her Hubert Herman's notion of the dialogical self. Has anybody read Hubert Herman's here? You guys know that? Okay. Um, well, I recommend it because I because I have a chapter in one of his books. Um, Anyway, so the notion of the dialogical self is that the self is fluid, that it assembles itself, that it assembles in order to meet a challenge give in a given context. And when, that, when that's over, it disassembles. And, um, and we, we put together a self based on the stories in the Nagi that seem relevant to the situation. And, and so if, if we're dealing with someone who has a fragmented self 
or a, or a discoordinated, disoriented self, um, then we think what they need are more stories, are, you know, stories that will create coherence. And, um, and so that's what we want to give them. And I've got a story about that. Um, and so once upon a time, um, we, we met a woman um, who wouldn't come out of her van. So she, she came to a place where we were doing, we, have, we do these things called healing hackathons. Have you ever heard of hackathons? Okay, so there's this really cool uh, woman from, who, who just graduated from MIT Fellowship in Design called Alexis Hope. And um, so she's, she's popularizing the term hackathon. And so a hackathon emerged out of the techie world where, where techie geeks come together to solve a problem or make a game or invent something. And Alexis um, said, Alexis did her PhD on um, make breast pumps stop sucking. And her idea was that the breast pump hadn't been improved in like 75 years, like since it was built. And so she got all these people together to make a better breast pump. And so we said, wow, we could do that with healing. We could, get, we could do healing hackathons. We could just get people together to do healing with each other. That would be fun. And so, um, so we've been doing that, I don't know, for about 20 years now. And so this, this particular woman showed up at one of our first day of one of our hackathons. And um, she wouldn't get out of the vehicle, you know. And so, um, so I talked to her through the, through the glass. She would roll down the, the window, at least. And it was, it was really a, a, a terribly sad story. You know, she um, suffered terrible sexual abuse, and she'd given birth to her grandfather's baby at age 12, and, um, you know, beaten and broken bones. And, well, it was just a um, really hard story. And, and over the course of the week, she finally came out of the van. And um, so I, I proposed that we do a ceremony. And um, we asked the spirits for help. And um, so we did. And we created a sacred fire. And we sat around the fire and sang and prayed. And, and um, so I heard this voice that said, give her a medal. And uh, so I looked at her and I said, you know, um, we, we need to give you a medal. And she said, what for? And I said, well, you, you, didn't you tell me all about how, you know, by taking on this abuse, you saved your siblings from, from it? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, doesn't that deserve a medal? And she's like, really? What? I said, we want to give you a medal. You know, it's, it's our version of a purple heart, you know? Uh, or the Order of Canada, <laughs> or whatever, you know. And, and so we, we created a medal for her to wear. And, and uh, by the end of the week, she could w come into the building. Well, that was good. And, and um, you know, um, we, kept, we kept working with her f over the course of about four years. And um, she eventually stopped being, stopped having any psychosis, and um, stopped having any hospitalizations. And eventually, we're still in touch with her, like 20 years later. And she's, she's a he now. Um, and she's a really productive, dynamic, marvelous person. So, um, so within the context of relationship, we gave her a better story. And we continue to promote the heroic journey. 10 minutes? OK, good. Um, so um, I may get to Ibn Sina, Sina or I may not. 
So I'm just going to um, go a little go a little further here. So the, it's, we're we we're, we're born into stories. You know that's why there's no bad people. People just people are just born into unhappy stories. And I wanted to get to I wanted to get to my numbers. Um, this is what we do at Wabanaki Public Health. We surround people in distress. And these are, this is my model for the voices in your mind, having a conference to decide which ones are going to organize themselves for this occasion. Let's see. Oh, this is, this is what we call a mind map. So, um, this was this was a mind map I made about so I I was working for a university psychology program that close. It wasn't making enough money. And um, so I needed to decide, you know, um, where to go next. And I had three offers. And so I said, well, well, who cares where I go? Well, the animals care. My animal friends care. Um, and uh, there's at least two animals there. And this is another good story of, of petting a wild kangaroo. One of, the, uh, one of the elders I met in Australia said, you're either crazy or you're a kangaroo whisperer. <laughs> she said, do you know how dangerous that was? I said, no. <laughs> she said, well, that's what probably saved you. <laughs> so. Um, so I, yeah, I, I had a, a patient once. Um, I don't think I told this story yesterday, and um, it was on the, the an inpatient locked inpatient unit. So stop me if I told this story yesterday. I don't think I did. And and a nurse bet me five dollars that I couldn't get a story out of this burned out schizophrenic person. And I said, um, that's a bad label. You know, she's a human being, and the nurse said, oh, you're just such a goody two-shoes. You know, she didn't really like me that much. And so I went up to this woman, and I said, hey, what's your sweet skill? And she said, oh, you know, whenever people want to rob junkyards for parts, they come find me, because I know how to calm junkyard dogs. I said, wow, that's a really good skill. And and I said, well, tell me about them. And so she told me about the culinary preferences of different breeds of dogs. And I said, well, if I'm going to go rob parts from a junkyard, and I don't know what kind of dog is there, what, what, what do I bring? And she said, peanut butter. They all love peanut butter. <laughs> so, so I went to where kangaroos were familiar with people. You know, it was an island called Raymond Island. And... Um, you know, they were wild, but they were, but people lived on the island and so did kangaroos. And so I put a bunch of peanut butter on a piece of bread and I sat there. I, I, I walked, I got as close to this herd of kangaroos as, as they would let me, which was about, I don't know, 30 meters. And I sat there for 45 minutes. And finally, this kangaroo comes over. He overcomes his shyness by, from the smell of peanut butter. And he, and he gobbles down the peanut butter, and I get to pet him. And I had the, the worst shock. Their fur feels like steel wool. <laughs> I thought they were soft and fluffy. No, steel wool. <laughs> Imagine petting steel wool. <laughs> what a letdown. <laughs> well, anyway, so I, I, I made all the characters, you know, this is this is um, my inner woodchuck and my inner coyote. Uh, my wife, she has a stake in where we go. Uh, the elders, there's a couple elders, and um, anyway, so I set up. I did this written dialogue among all these characters, and we ended up we settled on Maine. The other two choices were L.A. and San Francisco. <laughs> so. The animals said they would have a lot more fun in Maine and a lot more space. So anyway, um, I did want to, I'm going to just jump over to the data. I'll just, I'll just leave this up here. 
so you can look at it, because we got some numbers of people that we've worked with for more than six months. And uh, with that, I will, I will take comments, answers, and uh, other forms of, yes. Oh, you get a microphone. Um, so I just wanted to say I really appreciated your presentation, and and I really thought so much about your the various ways that you weave the idea of turning bad stories into good stories, including like the good story involving interconnectedness and interrelatedness. And I was, and the whole time I just kept thinking about how impoverished Western stories are, where they're just basically rooted in like the fun, like the moral is conquest or acquisition. And there's like no personal growth journey, but like what you were able to do, even in the story of somebody who like ends up getting a medal for what she survived is like turning something bad happened into some, into a personal growth and to a honoring of her courage, like all, all the ways that you, I just really appreciated it. And I just wanted to say that, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And it's really fun too. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And um, I think we should always have fun when we're working, if we can. They don't have much fun at the psychiatric hospital, I'll tell you that. <laughs> we have a question from online um, from Kaki Marino asking, are spirits drawn to sadness? Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think spirits are drawn to sadness. I had a dog, though, once who could pick out the person in the room who was thinking of suicide. It was amazing, this dog. I mean, she died of old age, but I would take her all over the place and she would like circle the room and she would just crawl, curl up in front of the person. And I would say, are you feeling really sad today? And invariably it was someone who was just really down and, and often thinking of suicide or, you know, this dog was amazing. I don't know how she did it. So um, I, dogs can smell sadness, I think. You know, uh, they probably can smell all kinds of things. And um, I, think, I think spirits mostly ignore us unless we put on a good show and get their attention. And then, you know, if we're sincere and, and we impress them, they, they help us sometimes if they want to. <laughs> On occasion. <laughs> Anything else from the from the invisibles? Uh, yes, we have a comment or question from Brooke W. Um, is the pain of ancestors being revealed in people living today? I felt that I have heard the pain of indigenous ancestors, though I am in a white body. Is it possible I am more perceptive to ancestors' grief and their ask for justice? We're all connected, and whatever whatever your genetic origins, we all feel each other's pain, is my belief. And there's also intergenerational trauma and epigenetics, you know, that you inherit the life experiences of your parents up to the time of your conception. So um, it, it's a big, crazy mess, you know, uh, an intricate spider web of sharing. And, and, you know, the, the elders would say, it's convenient to have a body so, so you can be found, but you are mo so much larger than your body. And, and we're, we're so interconnected. And, and we're, we, we share space like Venn diagrams. You know, we overlap. And, and we have to acknowledge that. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Yes. Um, are, is there any, are, are there ever harmful spirits or spirits that are engaged in something that ends up with something harmful? Yeah. And um, my friend Eduardo Duran used to carry a whiskey bottle with him into the hospital. And, and he would take out the bottle and he would say, well, the liquid is gone, but the spirit is still in there. He said, you want me to let it out? Because you've been talking to it a lot. And, you know, when you go talk to people who were, you know, in withdrawal from alcohol, and he would say, you know, probably you don't know the, the song to sing to it. You know, probably you're 
you're using this spirit without the proper rituals and songs, and maybe I could teach you, or maybe you could just leave it alone. <laughs> you know. So yeah, um, Eduardo talks about like um, the spirit of crystal meth. Like crystal meth has a spirit, and cocaine has a spirit, and um, one of his, one of the big messages that we put forth to people is, you know. Well, are you, are you singing the proper songs to your cocaine before you use it? And they look at me like I'm crazy, of course. Uh, but I'm like, you know, it's dangerous. It's like sorcery. If you use something, if you use a medicine without the right song, it's, you know, it's sorcery and that's dangerous. <laughs> and sometimes they blow me off, but occasionally they listen. <laughs> so yeah, those would be two examples. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question because I think we're already over. Um, I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about this idea that um, I've heard from spiritual teachers and I think also in like sort of spiritually oriented trauma circles that when one person is doing their inner, tr you know, their trauma healing work that comes from, say, patterns dysfunctional patterns that originate from the family of origin, um, that, that when that work is done, when the person finds healing or, or liberation, that, that generations before them are also liberated. They're also freed from those, from those dysfunctional or painful patterns that are maybe constricting their own spirits or their own, heal, their own spiritual sort of evolution. What do you think of that? Well, that's what the elders say, so it must be true. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, stay in touch. Uh, we have a, you know, get, get on our mailing list. We have a conference on Two-Eyed Seeing in January that's virtual, or you can come to Orono, Maine, <laughs> where it's minus 26. <laughs> Dr. Melodrono, what's the best way to reach you? There are people online asking. Oh, my my email. Do they see it online? No, they do not. I can. Well, then we could change that. Okay. Do, 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 do. Um, so, yeah, and, and I'm easy to find on Google. Yeah, as long as you can spell my name. I spelled it, so hopefully yeah, I'm going they'll find the you. Beginning so they can. Oh, here we go. Oh, perfect. There we go. So now Great. they can see it. Yeah. Yeah, so we'd love to have you at our Two Eyed Seeing Conference. And uh, it's cheap, <laughs> so, because um, we're terrible capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Um.